You know, we've, uh, we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, the financial markets, technologies that applies, you know, to the financial industry. Really another large area of uh, focus is this whole question of uh, data and access to data. Needless to say, uh, in, uh, in uh, finance and especially in economics, uh, data drives uh, much of the research and the av availability of uh, data, both uh, on a, on a uh, massive transactional basis as, uh, as well as other sort of unstructured has sort of exploded over the last several years. You know, our next uh, speaker is uh, going to be, uh, you know, uh, discussing uh, his research in that space. Uh, our speaker, uh, you know, Professor Rigobon has uh, been a, uh, he's, he's a member of the Society of Sloan, Fe Sloan Fellows. Uh, he's a professor of management and a professor of applied economics at MIT. Uh, he's a Venezuelan uh, economist whose area of his research are international economics, monetary economics, uh, and developmental economics. Uh, it's going to be really uh, an exciting uh, talk, and so uh, with no other ado, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Professor Ruggen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation, for the organizer, Antoinette. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation of being here. Uh, I have a disclaimer to, to do before I start. Uh, my son, uh, he was uh, one of the students at MIT that was involved with the, B, uh, with the Bitcoin uh, experiment. <laughs> and um, I, I, I want to clarify something in the data is that uh, he first calls me and says, I didn't know about the project, so he calls me and says, uh, Dad, MIT is giving me $100 for free, and I said, well, that's, that's because I'm a faculty, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then immediately he says, no, 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 they're giving this to everybody. I said, well, you know, I had fun in college, but not that much fun that I remember. So, uh, so I, I told him, okay, so explain me. So he explains that he's gonna get $100 on a, on a Bitcoin, and that he's going to sell immediately. <laughs> no, like he's gonna do all the work and get immediately for that. I said, to, why? I mean, th th this is research. They want to understand your behavior. Yes, and I'm going to sell immediately. <laughs> so, <laughs> before taking any course, they said, do you know what Bitcoin is? I have no idea, but it's $100, and I need the $100. Immediately. And then, I said, and then he said, and I'm going to convince all my friends that they should sell immediately. You know, you know in Christian, when he showed you the, the, the campus of MIT where the people sold, there's a big... Big, big round, that is my son's dorm. <laughs> okay, in fact, I just, texted, I just texted during lunch, I said, how many friends do you have at MIT? And he said, 450, which coincide with the 11% that sold within the first month. So, <laughs> so um, I'm sorry for screwing your research, uh, Christian. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what, I, what I would like to do is, uh, is to talk about uh, two projects that uh, we have at MIT. Um, I, I, it is true that I'm still a macroeconomist, but truly, uh, the last 12 years, I have become uh, uh, someone that is obsessed with uh, collecting data. It's, 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 it's horribly boring. That's why they put me at the end of this, uh, uh, this talk, because I'm going to talk about inflation, things that you, know, you just don't want to hear about it. But I actually think that we measure life but very badly, every aspect of life. I think that we measure depression very badly. Uh, we always do the diagnostic too late. I think that we measure happiness too badly, and therefore we don't pay attention to that. I think we measure the quality of relationships so badly that we only know that they are broken when they are broken. I think that we measure GDP incredibly badly, inflation incredibly badly. I think that we actually measure life incredibly badly. And we make decisions every day based on those incredibly incorrect measures. It's not that I'm going to offer you a better one. <laughs> 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 but I, th I think we have the possibility of improving that. And what I want to do is to show you the possibilities, not necessarily the improvements. I think these phenomena are very complex, and therefore we all are doing approximations of that measurement. And the approximations are always, they are approximations. But what we have today is that technology is allowing us to collect data in a manner that we have never been able to collect. And, uh, and, and, and I hear many times people saying that the value is in the data. And my friends, the value is not in the data. The value is in what we do with the data. There's a distance between data, information, and knowledge. 
Companies should thrive to try to produce knowledge. And in fact, let me just give you an example. Data are the financial statements of the organization. That truly, to be honest, that's not very useful. But we compute something, and a statistic, return on investment, return on assets. And it happens to be that that becomes informative. We can make decisions uh, using that statistic. And then we use it so regularly, that becomes part of our knowledge. That's what we should thrive about it. Technology is allowing us to collect more data. It has not allowed us to produce better information. We have to do the mapping. And this mapping is becoming harder and harder. My example is Word for Windows. I don't know if you realize, I don't have an accent whatsoever in speaking in English, but I am actually from Venezuela. <laughs> so, you know, I have been living in the United States for only 23 years, and, you know, I, I still speak this way. That's, I could speak like Simon with that British accent, but I just find it too arrogant, so. Uh, <laughs> and I speak this way because I am daring Trump to kick me out of the country anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole point is, uh, uh, surprisingly, I barely speak English, and I have written papers, which is, you know, <laughs> thank God for what for Windows. Why? Because truly, when I was working on financial crisis, actually, I wrote one paper, okay? And then, uh, when the next crisis took place, I, I just did a search and replace, okay? And I changed the name of the country and the capital. I didn't even bother to change the data. And, uh, and, and people, you know, and I wrote my second paper. And, and you know, I have written 43 papers that way. And, um, <laughs> And in fact, I have written uh, three times uh, for Mexico because Mexico has had three financial crises in the time. So, you know, and then I go to the countries and, you know, Philippines, which I don't even know in the map where they are, and say, you know so much about our country. <laughs> I say, yeah, 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 you know, you know, MIT professor, a genius. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, see, Word for Windows allows us to write more words, paragraphs, and sentences than ever before in humankind. But I can uh, assure you, we do not produce better literature today than 300 years ago. The fact that you can write more words doesn't mean that we organize them in a better way. And the big data has that challenge. Big data will allow us to get more data. And it's in our creativity and our discipline of how we organize that data that we will be able to produce information that is relevant, actionable, and actually actually closer to reality, to capture the phenomena that we're interested in. So uh, I divide the data in two parts. And in uh, fact, uh, a lot of people talk about design data. I work a lot with statistical offices. Statistical offices are obsessed with surveys. That's what they do. Most of what we collect from unemployment uh, data to retail sales to the GDP is all coming from surveys. There's a lot of data that is administrative, that people, some of the administrative data is called uh, a, a, a big data in the sense that, for example, your IRS records, stuff like that, are administrative data. I like to talk about organic data, which is the data that we generate without knowing. So this is the data that, for example, a, a, is generated by, for example, what Andrew was talking about, the devices that you have on your, on your wrist and by your cell phones. Uh, most of you call this a phone, no? It's a cell phone, a smartphone. In fact, if you are from Latin America, you will call this a mobile phone, but this actually is not a phone whatsoever. In fact, it doesn't have the most important property of a phone. I mean, I do remember uh, in the old times when you have a phone on the kitchen that you had, no? So this would be a typical call in my house, like, hi, how are you, Roberto? Yes, yes, how are you? It's my boss. Roberto, you are fired. What? What do you mean I'm fired, you miserable bastard? You cannot fire me, I quit! And then you smash the phone. The most important action that a phone provides is the stress release of a smack in that. Now, use this device. Roberto, yes, David, how are you? You are fired. Yeah, you cannot fire me. I quit. <laughs> you have to be kidding me. That's a computer with sensors. She said, okay, if it were a phone, you would throw it out. You know, that's what you do with the Nokias nowadays. Anyway, so, <laughs> or the galaxies, if they burn, you saw the fire. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, but the organic data has a very important property, is that you create data without you knowing. You are being surveyed without you being questioned. And, and that, from the perspective of measurement, that has extremely important properties. 
For example, when you search on Google, you are searching something you are interested. So I know something about you. When you buy on the credit card, you are buying things that you care. So I know your transactions. When you go to the GPA, these are the things that you visited. These are things that you are being surveyed without telling. Now, there's an important aspect of privacy on the organic data that uh, we have to solve. And I would say that the United States is one of the ones that is lagging the most in, in, in regulation in terms of privacy. I mean, Europe is way ahead in this sense. Um, but organic data has this ability. It's, I'm doing a survey, and you, are not, you don't know you're being questioned. And then, therefore, from the measurement point of view, that's very important. Let me ask you a question. They're going to ask you to fill a survey about this, uh, this event. They're going to give you a piece of paper, and they're going to say, like, can you tell me your opinion? Uh, when that happens, uh, can you tell me how you feel? Like, uh, you say, like, woohoo! I can feel a survey! Finally, I'm going to get an exam and I get an A! No, I mean, like, that doesn't happen. No, you're not happy when they ask you for a survey. It's a horrible, horrible experience. <laughs> like, like, I have to answer the question? Can I just pick A? No, no, please. You know, can you read the question? No, no, just A all. I mean, it, we want your opinion. It, by the way, please fill the survey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, uh, remember the two things. According to David, fill the survey and, and, and put a check attached to it. Anyway, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's also important uh, uh, to understand that surveys are incredibly invasive and disruptive. And, and, and organic data has the ability uh, to do that survey without noticing. So let me tell you the service that we are doing, okay? And this is without people noticing. One is uh, the Billion Prices Project. Um, let me, let me say something about the pronouns. When I say I, I mean Alberto Cavallo and myself, OK? So this is all done by Alberto Cavallo. In fact, Alberto Cavallo did all this work. Uh, he did all the programming. He does all the economic analysis. He does absolutely everything. <clears throat> I, I just do the most important and, and most difficult part of the job, which is take credit, uh, handle the money. <laughs> The celebrity, when they call me, like Taylor Swift wants to write a song about me, and you know, please, no. Uh, so, do you, know, you understand how difficult that is? Anyway, so, uh, so when I say I, I mean Alberto and myself, okay? So, the two of us. When I, see, when I say we, it means Alberto alone. <laughs> so, so, when I say I'm going to change the world, it means the two of us. When I said we screw up, it's Alberto, okay? <laughs> So, uh, so, but what we do is uh, we go to web pages, and, uh, and we started uh, thinking about this uh, when Argentina started manipulating the data on inflation rate, and we thought, well, it's clearly a, a problem of mismeasurement. Can, how can we actually do this differently? So we went to web pages, and, and I always thought that the most difficult part was to collect the data. But that, again, that's the technology aspect. Collecting the data is, uh, is difficult, but once you have a massive amount of data, what part of that data you have to use? And in fact, the most important aspect is to understand how to construct representative baskets. But the way we construct the inflation rate is very similar to what a statistical office does. You have a basket of products. And once you have the basket of products, you collect the prices. We collect the prices every single day. And, and, uh, and uh, we construct the baskets given what the stores show. So for example, when Apple releases the iPhone 7, well, that day we have a price, and the following day you have an inflation rate. And, and because I know the way the web page is, is, is organized, I know immediately uh, that that product will become very important for the sales of Apple. I also know which products are discontinued incredibly fast. So our baskets are very different from what the typical procedure is. Some of the critiques that statistical offices have, we have been able to solve. Um, but in the end, what we do is we produce these indexes. These are all the places where we collect. Um, and by the way, this is not exactly completely true. I mean, we just lost Venezuelan uh, about uh, three months ago. Um, um, uh, the situation there has been very bad. And so and Egypt, we, we have many, many gaps. So not all the countries are collected all the time. Not, not all the countries have all the sectors. Collecting the price of haircut is very difficult. I don't know how many of you get a haircut online. Uh, in fact, you know, in fact, if you get a haircut online, you get this haircut. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's just not, not that easy to get uh, services, but you know, we collect uh, from, from all the sectors. Um, uh, let me just show you how these indexes look like. This is the United States uh, since 2008. Uh, the red line is uh, my uh, daily um, uh, 
uh, consumer price index. This includes all the sectors. We do have services here, like hotels, education, um, uh, air, air travel, uh, health, financial services, etc. And uh, a couple of things that I want to highlight. Uh, the, uh, the blue line is the inflation rate that is computed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, a couple of things is that they are not identical. I never expected them to be identical. These are different markets, different procedures. But it's remarkable how close it is. Now, there are certain properties about this uh, that I would like to highlight of where the value actually happens. It's very important. I am not predicting. I am not. I'm not forecasting. In fact, I work for, for the census of the United States. I am part of the census. I'm also part of the BA, the BLS, of, of 13 statistical offices of the United States. So I'm, I am an insider to all these statistical offices. So I, I have, let me, let, me, let me say, I have a tremendous respect. I have visited 31 statistical offices on Earth. I have a tremendous respect for what they do. Uh, now, to maximize entertainment, from now on, I'm just going to bash them. Is that, is that clear? <laughs> just, just destroy them from what, what is left from the talk. Uh, but uh, it, it is very interesting because it, it is regularly the, the case that the, that the people from the statistical office ask me, well, but you know, your line is diverging. No? They always say, like, your line is far from our numbers. I said, uh, yeah, you should do your job better. <laughs> That's usually my answer. There is a very important distance between prediction and measurement. So when you are predicting something, you have a benchmark that you want to actually track. When you are measuring, you are producing a benchmark. This is about production of the benchmark. And therefore, there are tremendous discrepancies. And, but you will see the beauty in a second. But let me show you the US. Let me show you the euro. Uh, uh, let me show you uh, Argentina. So, in, in fact, um, they stop producing official data uh, 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 in 2015. So that's why this long. I remember a reporter from Argentina once called me and says, like, do you find a discrepancy between the official inflation rate and the Argentinian inflation rate? I said, oh, it's only one digit. He said, that? That's it? Yeah, yeah, it's only one digit. So it was an inflation rate about a two-year span. He said, the official data, the inflation rate is 40%. He said, yeah, ours is 140. <laughs> yes. <sir. laughs> So just one digit. Now, what are, what are, what are the aspects of that? He says, this is, these are zooms of the United States data. I just want to show you some of the things that happen. And what is very, very interesting is that actually the online prices tend to always turn before the offline prices. The blue line is what the BLS has. The online prices always tend to bottom down or actually move a little bit earlier than the other. And the reason of that, first, is methodologies. By collecting the data daily, uh, it has different properties. Second very important thing is that online consumers are different than offline consumers. Man, you probably don't know, but you have no memory. So when you buy online, you think, oh, I'm getting a good price. Because you are very competitive at the moment where you're purchasing. So you compare all your web pages, and then you buy. You say, I am a genius. I got the cheapest possible price. And then I ask you, what was the price of that item yesterday? I don't know. <laughs> so how do you know you got it cheap? It was cheap today. <laughs> Isn't it cheaper today than yesterday? No. For example, uh, very few people know that the flowers prices increase on February the 1st. They actually double. And then the price of the flowers in fact, per bulb of roses drop by 30% just before Valentine's Day. So people think they're getting a 30% discount, when actually the prices of roses are about 50% you know, more expensive than in January. By the way, they go up again after Valentine's Day, and then they come down about on the 17th of February. I have used this data to explain to my wife why I always get the flowers too late. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm saving about 30% the price of the flowers. Please, if you see her, tell her that this is a very good reason. <laughs> she is not very convinced. But, but the fact that you have no memory means that you cannot get upset. And that's very important for stores. See, in France, the price of a baguette has been one euro for the last 254 years. Okay? In fact, before the euro existed, they already knew 
that the price of the baguette had to be one euro. So how does inflation take place? Well, the baguette just becomes smaller and smaller, and that's how the croissant was invented. Is that okay? <laughs> so, so, because if you sell them the baguette at a more than one euro, they burn the store. Is that, and it's, and it's, in, it's, in, in Italy, it will be pasta. If you change the price of pasta, we just kill you, okay? We go to the Roman times, take all your parts of the body, like, you know, uh, Game of Thrones, and put in the four corners of the empire to make sure no one ever will ever increase the price of pasta. But when Amazon sells you something more expensive, and you realize it. First, where is the store to be burned? But second, if you have no memory, how can you get upset? And it's, uh, it's actually kind of a very important event, and, and, and we see this happening in all the countries. There's a significant part of the anticipation that this turns way earlier than others. And that's, um, that's, uh, that's because we're trying to measure both the Bureau of Labor Statistics and, and ourselves, we're trying to measure the same phenomena. We're just trying to understand the exact same phenomena. It just happens that the stores have different properties. This happens in almost every country in our data, from China to Uruguay to Argentina to Chile to the United States to the UK. Um, let me just tell a little bit about the other things that you can do with this, is that not only we can measure things a little bit faster and therefore understand these inflection points of inflation rate, but the thing, second thing that is important, at least uh, from the measurement and in financial sector, is to try to get a better measure of what happens uh, with the economy. There's something in, 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 in that most central bankers are very concerned that is called the core inflation. Have you heard the core inflation? I want to see, raise your hands. You're in the financial sector, ah, excellent. Everybody knows about the core inflation. And the core inflation is the inflation at the core of the United States. It's, not, I mean, it's like all central banking words, they have so much meaning. No? It's like we're doing quantitative easing. Have you ever asked a central banker, what is quantitative easing? Well, we're easing a quantity. <laughs> uh, thank you. No, that's, that's, uh, it, it's, well, the core inflation, the purpose of the core inflation is to try to understand what is the inflation rate in the economy that is due to your demand that excludes shocks that the central bank cannot control. For example, oil prices. If the oil price goes up, the price of gasoline increases. That creates inflation in the country, and I should not, as a central banker, I should not react to that inflation rate. That is not due to you consuming too much, that's you maybe, I don't know, a strike of oil uh, in, in Nigeria. And therefore, they try to do this and the way they solve that is by doing an exclusion procedure. They take this basket of the CPI and they take the part that is related to gasoline, which in this case in the United States would be gasoline and transportation and energy, and they take it out of the index. I always ask them, what about the indirect effects? Because if the price of gasoline is higher, then the cost of transportation will be higher, which means that all the imported items to the United States are gonna be more expensive. So let's think about excluding everything that uses import components. And then, because the price of energy is more expensive, let's take out of the index everything that consumes energy. <laughs> so no energy and no import. What are you left out with? So the true core, I mean in Italy, what do they measure that consumes no energy and no import components, nothing. So the point is, we, what we would like to do is to construct counterfactuals, is to construct an inflation rate that corrects for direct and indirect effects. And what I'm just showing you is the inflation rate since the last year uh, of that one. This blue line is what is called the, the inflation rate uh, from the headline, what I just showed you, the, the, the blue line that I showed you in the previous graph. Uh, it's just a daily uh, CPI. Uh, from our data. The red line is we use that data and replicate what the Bureau of Labor Statistics does to construct the core. And the green line is uh, what we uh, can compute. It's the counterfactual. It's taking out direct and indirect effects of both oil and the exchange rate in this case. Why this is, is important? According, if you look at what the central bank is looking right now in the United States, the economy looks like they are on recovery, but this is not very fast recovery. Actually, the underlying inflation, it is hard for them to find inflation. And they tell you all the time, 
we have no inflation whatsoever. In fact, the inflation rate since 2005 to today is a bit, little bit less than 2%. So they tell you, I don't find inflation rate. Well, a lot of that inflation rate are indirect effects. Actually, our measure of the economy in the United States is doing way better than what the measurement of the economy is doing right now. By the way, when I compute the green line in, in Japan, it's a flat line. I didn't bring it. It's a flat line. It's a zero or negative. When I do that for Europe, it looks like a zero. So it's not always the case that the green line is above the others. So in some sense, uh, one of the aspects is not only to replicate what we measure, but that we can actually have the ability to measure things uh, that we don't measure regularly. Um, let me tell you uh, just for uh, two minutes uh, about uh, my other project. This is about the billion prices project. It's a, it's a derivative. I call this a thousand Big Macs uh, project. Uh, you probably um, know the Big Mac index from The Economist. Everybody knows that? OK. The Big Mac index is actually a brilliant index. Uh, um, it's a major critique to what the World Bank and the United Nations do. They have a program that is called the ICP program. Uh, let me just, uh, I, I wanted to put a summation. Is that OK? I mean, you, you, we cannot have this without a summation. Anyway, let me just explain. So. Um, so the, the ICP program is it, what they, they did, the World Bank, is to compare prices uh, uh, across the world. And, and the purpose is to construct what is called the purchasing power parity. So they want to know if I give you $100 in India, or in fact, in New Delhi in particular, then uh, uh, what can you buy? And if I give you the same $100 in Rome, what do you buy? And $100 in New York, what do you purchase? So the idea is to understand what is your ability to purchase and capacity to purchase. This is a massive, massive. Uh, effort, and uh, more than 105 statistical offices contribute. But, but it's, it, the problem is that they don't compare the same items. So it's, it's very heavily criticized. They take French wine in France, and Argentinian wine in Argentina, and Italian wine in Italy. And they, they don't have to. They don't have to coincide. The prices don't have to move the same. The qualities are different. So it is very heavily criticized. And in fact, the economist has one of these uh, massive critiques. So, now, the problem is that the Big Mac uh, index is just one product, which is you know, three pieces of bread with some sauce, and, and, and two patties that look and smell like meat, but they are not. No? <laughs> In fact, I actually think that, that, that McDonald's has to be the most productive uh, manufacturing company in the, ever in the history of, man, of humankind. Because according to their webpage, they have sold 50 billion burgers with only one kilogram of meat, OK? <laughs> no, so, so, so the point is, it is hard to understand why that will be relevant for the economy. Why one product alone will be that relevant. So these two camps hate each other, OK? The World Bank hates the, the, the economies, and then the economies hate the World Bank. And I have friends in both. And I, I feel always very bad because my friends are fighting with each other. And I said, the only way to reunite enemies is that they get at a common enemy. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm telling that both suck. Anyway, so, so what, what we do is I'm going to take things in the spirit of the Big Mac. I'm going to take many, many items. These are going to be thousands of items. They are going to be all identical. Uh, this is not a representative basket. I'm going to take tomatoes in Brazil. I'm going to look at the price of tomato in Brazil in reais. I'm going to divide that by the tomato in, United, in the United States. So that tells me what is the exchange rate implied in the tomato. And I do that for the iPad, and I do that for electronics, and I do that for clothing in Sara, for clothing in H&M, for shoes for Nike, et cetera. So we take a bunch of products, and I look at the exact same product in Brazil and United States. And when I say identical, is this will be a Sony TV LCD smart between 52 and 56 inches uh, flat. Uh, you know, the specifications are uh, uh, up to uh, very, very narrowly defined products. When we do that, we're going to compare what is the exchange rate from the retailers. This is what the retailers are telling me. And I'm going to compare that to what you see in Bloomberg, which is the exchange rate from the financial markets. And uh, this is more or less how they look like. And it's actually remarkable how, uh, in fact, if, if I don't tell you which one is which, you will not know who is the retailer and who is the financial market. So just, just for the record, the blue lines are what happens in financial markets. The red line is what happens in retailers. And, and these are very particular retailers. These are all multinationals. And the interesting thing, Australia, I'm just showing you Australia first because there's nothing particularly wrong about Australia. Uh, but 
but I want to show you, for example, what happened in South Africa. And it's very interesting that for many years, the retailers and the exchanger, they were moving together. And then suddenly, when the rand starts to devalue very fast, the retailer said, uh-uh, my consumers cannot endure that price increase. Implicitly, the retailer is telling me, you know what? I cannot raise prices. Even though I have they have increased for a long time, they cannot increase at the same speed. And by the way, this is not one company. Because if this were SADA, then I could argue, well, the demand for SADA is low, so SADA is a screw. No, I have SADA, H&M, Nike, Adidas, Massimo Dutti. So when you have all of these companies all at the same time, and they are all telling me that they cannot increase their prices at the same speed, it tells me a lot about the demand of that country. And we can learn what happens to that demand. Uh, by the way, uh, this is the UK. And one very important question will be, what happened after Brexit? Because these lines have been together for a long time. So what is going to give? And they will return. And the question will be, well, when these retailers will actually uh, change prices? Uh, in Brazil, uh, if you look, uh, 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 we see a tremendous discrepancy now. And the question will be, well, the retailers have not followed the appreciation. So we have had very good times in financial markets. And the retailers kind of do not trust that that might happen. So and this is Argentina. You can see these are the periods where the exchange was controlled when it was free. It's remarkable how close the retailers were. Uh, still, the retailers, uh, there's some more depreciation uh, in the pipeline for Argentina. So let me just finish with this and, and, and take questions. Um, I think we have the possibility uh, of using uh, big data uh, to, to measure things differently. And, uh, and the way we can do that uh, is first to understand very well what the phenomena are. Uh, each of these projects have taken more than five years. Uh, first, to understand how they do it. Second, to understand how is the possibilities to, to improve it. And third, then go and collect the data to understand what data we can incorporate for that. But I think that we have uh, uh, better information and we are able to produce better information. Certainly, we will be able to uh, uh, have much better decisions afterwards. Um, thank you so much for staying for uh, this long. And uh, let me see if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, give me the box. What's that? You want to throw the box? Yes. Who wants a question? <laughs> no, to the back, no. I'm pretty sure this will be unsafe. <laughs> In fact, there's a guy with a camera here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Since your baskets are, are very inclusive, what stops you from including um, uh, products that are also asset classes in themselves, like art. So asset classes, you mean like financial? No, why what, what, don't you include art in your very inclusive art? baskets? Oh, yeah. art is there. Yes, 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 yes. Real so, estate? Yes, 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 yes. So if we have, in, in, in our basket of entertainment, uh, we have uh, the price of, um, of yes, uh, not only jewelry, but things that you will find in, in a, in a in web real page. estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's so. not in there, I guess? Financial well, what is not there? The, the question is how much is there? For example, uh, uh, when you go to the Amazon webpage, uh, Amazon actually shows uh, every single day 53 million different products in the United States. So um, from those 53 million different products, uh, about 22 million products are CDs and DVDs. And about 12 million products are, 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 are uh, uh, books. So truly. Do you really need to download all 53 million just to collect the price of CDs and DVDs and books? You probably need like 500. So, so the question is, we download from everything, but then what we make to the index is very small. So art has a very small weight. But we do collect everything that we can find on the web. Yes, that would be true. On the back, yes. Uh, yeah, your work on the implied exchange rate, is that data available publicly? Us? No, no, not yet, and it's just, um, yeah, no, not yet the data is not available. Uh, and the main reason is that uh, 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 MIT pay me, pays me such a low salary that, uh, that I'm trying to make as much money with that uh, project as possible, and then I will make it available. <laughs> no, 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 that's not the reason. Is that, is it still, for example, <laughs> I actually, now that I said it, it sounds way, way much better than my future. Anyway, <laughs> yes, I have three kids in college, so yes. But so, 
<laughs> yeah, so please, if you see the dean, tell him to increase my salary. Uh, <laughs> that's one thing that you have to remember. Uh, no, no the, the <laughs> everybody's telling you to remember something. Uh, this will be easier to remember. Uh, in fact, actually, I think Antoinette will agree on that one. <laughs> so, no, the, the issue is that we're still, so I don't have all the sectors. So for example, I don't have personal care. So I have not uh, matched Procter & Gamble yet around the world. Is that, so, so I'm still working on, uh, when I said I, I mean uh, Alberto is doing <laughs> so. <laughs> so you know, uh, I'm actually just having fun here and Alberto is working like an animal there. Anyways. <laughs> So, no, but we, we, need, we need all the sectors. And so, so th this is more meaningful when you have all the tradable sectors. So we just finished with gasoline. Uh, so we match all gasoline worldwide. And now we have the price of gasoline. And, and, and we match them in terms of qualities and delivery. Um, so, so we need to finish. So th the reasons this is not available yet uh, until, the, until the time that, that we can actually uh, make it available. But yes. Yes. You have the index, which is identical products, in, identical uh, in different locations. But in different locations, what people actually consume may be very different. So French fries might cost a certain amount, but people eat yams. You know, people may choose to do different types of things because of their environment. So how do you capture the fact that, in a sense, if you're looking at identical goods, you're, you're looking at things which sort of trade at, at the global level, and there are many, many local things. You know, people eat hummus uh, in, instead of steak? Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. So the difference between the two indexes is that the first index, I want this to be representative of the country I'm capturing. The second index, the purpose of the second index is to try to understand if countries are on an unsustainable path. So it's a very different question. What I want to measure, what we want to measure so what the World Bank is interested in is in measuring the purchasing power parity. And for them, including services and the way you eat proteins, for example, matters a lot. So I'm not criticizing the World Bank in that objective. Uh, the World Bank, you know, in, in, in India will have more, you know, uh, you know um, uh, grains and different, different type of products. In, in Argentina, they will have meat. No? And, you know, how, how the Argentinians eat their water with meat. And, you know, the, 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 it's meat and wine. That's it. And that's all the basket. So in, in the case of, uh, uh, of, of India, you will have you know, onions and something else. Anyways, <laughs> so, so the basket, so what the World Bank is trying to compare a standards of living, they, they have two approaches. One is to understand the components, carbohydrates, um, uh, proteins, and how you consume the sugars, etc. So in that sense, that's a very different form of basket, and you're comparing those two. In macroeconomics, it's very important to understand if the same product suddenly are sold at very different prices, especially if the product can be traded internationally. So this is more about sustainability. And in fact, a, a lot of people use the, world, the data from the World Bank to try to assess if the country is sustainable or not. So when we look at right now in Brazil, for example, we tend to say, that, well, Brazil, the exchange rate is too appreciated. For example, that's exactly what the, what this, the World Bank says about the United States. I did not show you the data about the US. But the US, they claim that the US is heavily appreciated. It means that we're on an unsustainable path of consumption. In fact, that graph appears on every one of the documents from the, from the, from the Federal Reserve. Uh, truly, when we look at our data, that's not the case. The US is not appreciated, not at all. It's just, it's just real estate. Now, it's very difficult to buy real estate in New York and export that to London. That's a very difficult transaction. So, so the point is, truly, we use a data that has a purpose to evaluate standards of living in terms of consumption of proteins. And we use that data to make an assessment about the economy. And that is a massive, massive, massive leap of faith. So what we are trying to do is to fill that gap. And, it's a, and this one is not representative. It's our identical products. And to me, it's very meaningful when H&M and Sara tells me that the price in Brazil goes up relative to the United States and faster than the exchange rate depreciation. That tells me that they feel that the demand is very strong. And that's the, that's the signal that we're trying to extract from here. That's it. Yes. No, no box for you. If I understood correctly, at the beginning you said that we, we measure things in correct light. And one of the examples you used is the US GDP. That you said that 
Yes. Oh, not necessarily the GDP. OK, good question. So, <clears throat> so uh, um, should I pledge a Republican or Democrat here? You just to know how you're going to take my answer. <laughs> OK, so, so, let, so let me be, let, let me be the, 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 the Republican. No, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to So uh, no, what, what, what I, mean, I, I don't measure GDP yet, OK? So uh, but, but my, um, uh, our goal is to actually measure daily GDP. Yeah, so, so what, what I measure is the health of the demand. The US demand is way healthier than what we are computing on the BLS and the BA. So I indeed, indeed that, that I can claim uh, correctly. And I have been saying this for a while. So, uh, so I have computed that core um, many times now. Once every quarter, it takes a long time. It takes about a week to compute that core. This is very complicated. And, uh, and the US demand is way healthier than we are actually measuring right now. That, that I can say. That does not translate to GDP. Is that okay? For GDP, I'm trying to find tax records. Yes, Stuart. Oh, oh, no more questions. You see, Stuart, nobody likes you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. <laughs>